Abdul Hamid, who is an astronomer attached at the University of Malaya Radio Cosmology Research Lab. And interestingly enough, he is sort of like our returning participant lah. All star. Kalau boleh dia tak tahu nak masuk. No. <laughs> so he has participated back in 2016. 2017 and also in 2019, 18, right? So Mr. Fiyadu Amit will be here for the next three minutes entertaining you about the wonderful world of astronomy. And without further ado, let us welcome Mr. Afiq. Understand the universe have expanded beyond the singular sense of sight. What am I talking about? I'm talking about astrophysical messengers, cosmic mailmen that penetrate through the depths of infinity to deliver us information on incredible things like exploding stars and colliding black holes that we would otherwise be blind to if we only looked at light alone. Now beyond light, there are three other astrophysical messengers that we know of so far, cosmic rays, gravitational waves, and neutrinos. Tiny, elusive particles that are right now shooting through you and me as I speak. Hold on to me for that. Hold on to that for me, will you? I won't be talking about all three of these messengers because if I did, we'd end up in a 10 kilometer deep hole in Antarctica and I did not pack a sweater. But I will talk about gravitational waves because they are the closest that my research relates to. Right. So super massive black holes, there's one in the heart of every galaxy. And somewhere in the universe right now, two galaxies are merging to become one. And as they do so, they're colliding super massive black holes in the vibrations of space time that very suddenly change the distance between you and me by a fraction, the width of an atom. That's comparable in size and scale to the monthly savings of your average fresh graduate in today's economy. Now there's an incredible astrophysical experiment that we can do to detect these space-time vibrations by observing pulsars, which can be thought of as cosmic lighthouses, and comparing the deviations of the expected arrival times of the signals of pulsars in one part of the sky versus the deviations of the expected arrival times of the signals of pulsars in another part of the sky. We can tune it to a cosmic choir of colliding galaxies that will allow us to further validate Einstein's theories of gravity and to unlock the true nature of black holes. But there's a problem. Just as how storm clouds obscure a lighthouse on the ocean, interstellar matter delays the pulsar signal. This very small delay needs to be compensated for, similar to how you might compensate for a friend who is delayed because of bad weather. Now, what's all of this worth, you may wonder? What can it give us beyond even more mysteries to power the growth of more science, technology, art, and human curiosity? Well, I don't think even Einstein knew the answer to that, but I'll tell you what. Come with me, and let's find out. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Afik, for your presentation. Now let's turn our attention to the, the right side, not too far away, Galaxy of Judges, for your Q&A. Um, Afik. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting topic. Um, the way you presented this topic is not an easy one, but you still managed to delve into it. Now, uh, are, you, are you attached with UC Malaya at this point of time? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're working with Zainal, 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 right? Thank you very much. Now, you mentioned just now about neutrino. Are you referring, sorry, to neutrino or neutron stars? Oh, yeah, cool. Uh, that's a very good question. Right. It's very intersectional in between what I talked about yeah. and the area of study for my uh, master's. Yeah. Uh, so I did mention something about pulsars. So they're yes. two very different things. Yes. Uh, neutrinos are very tiny, elusive, not massless. They do have, have a mass yes. particles that are shooting yeah. through all of us right now. They, go, they would go through the earth like a hot knife through butter. <laughs> and so they're all going, and we have a neutrino detector in Antarctica, that's why I said if I were to talk about neutrinos, we'd end up in a 10 kilometer deep hole in Antarctica. Now you also talked about neutron stars. Yes. So that's what I did for my masters. I was looking at pulsars. 
Um, when a massive star dies, it explodes and leaves behind this shell that rotates and emits uh, radio waves. And we call them pulsars. So as pulsars age, they kind of stop dancing. <laughs> and uh, they become neutron stars. Yeah. And yeah, I could go on and on. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, coming back to this, in a nutshell, what is a multi messenger astronomy? Right. Just very simple, but with the physics in it. OK. Uh, so how do we know what we know about the universe? We can either send probes to explore, or we can look for signals that come to us. We have the most common signal that we've looked at ever since the beginning of human species, which is light, right? That's one type of astrophysical messenger. So as the discipline of astronomy has grown up, we've discovered that it's more than just light that's coming to us from the universe. It's cosmic rays, it's gravitational waves, and it's neutrinos. And we're beginning to see a much larger picture of the universe as we make discoveries in this new age of multi-messenger astrophysics. So can I say that the, uh, the rays basically comes from neutron stars, which they, they emit electromagnetic radiation, you call it pulsars, am I right? Yeah, yeah. So and then the other one is basically the gravitational waves, yeah. all right? Which has been existed for billions of years. So one of the tasks you are trying to see is hear the murmuring or the hum of those particular waves, yes. all right? Yeah. Or that, huh? yeah. Now, uh, what is the significance of this gravitational wave? Okay. I knew that question would be coming eventually because, you know, the lay people would always ask, like, what's all of this good for? I mean, I have bills to pay, I have kids to feed, mouths to feed. And, you know, the best I could promise you is uh, better GPS, more precise GPS, because as we constrain... I'm not referring to that one, I'm sorry, because the field is quite wide. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that, remember, this thing was only discovered in 2017 by the Australian uh, lady scientist, right? Oh, 2017. No, gravitational waves yes. were first detected in 2017, yes. but they then, were postulated before, correct, earlier on. by Einstein in yes. relatively famous. So thing. my question is, why do they need to see this gravitational wave? What can they infer from it? Okay, so I did mention about this cosmic wire colliding galaxy. And that's referred to as the gravi gravitational wave background. It's a superposition of multiple gravitational wave sources. You could think of it as like the hum or the sound of the universe. If, if light is, is the sight of the universe, the gravitational waves are the sound of the universe. Um, and as we become more precise in our instruments of listening to the gravitational wave background, it becomes more than just the background. It becomes discrete individual sources that we can pinpoint, we can look at areas in the sky. We, we like, we, we take a listen, boom, there's a colliding galaxy. Have a listen, boom, there's a colliding galaxy. And in, in many billions of years from now, we will become a colliding galaxy when the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy <laughs> merge together. We will produce our own, our galaxy will produce its own gravitational waves. And we live at an interesting time when we can actually listen in to these things. And, uh, one last question on the order of magnitude. How uh, big is a neutron star and uh, how massive it is? Okay. Meaning in terms of the earthly size. Yep, yep. All right. So neutron stars, surprise, surprise, uh, they're only 10 kilometers across. They are stars the size of a city, but containing them within them more mass than like two times our solar system. Uh, that's because when a massive star dies, all that mass gets compressed into a 10 kilometer ball. And it would be like, you know, the size of kale. <laughs> but, you know, the gravitational effects and the magnetic effects would be insane. I wouldn't want to be that close to it <laughs> if it's there, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. I, I guess no questions from Atazalia and JK. Okay. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Got one coming from JK. Somebody needs to speak the English side of it. I want the physics side. <laughs> um, so good to see you. Thank you. Glad to be back. You should be the poster boy of uh, MLAB Malaysia. But yet I've never won nationals. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's not about the win. Um, okay. I have two questions. First, if let's say we have the capacity to send an astronaut, the super space shuttle and it goes into a black hole right? 
Okay. Uh, they would get spaghettified. But the trick to doing that is hitting the black hole at just the right angle that you get a free time travel trip. <laughs> and I think you'd end up somewhere in the future because my understanding going back in time is possible, but going forward in time, you know, with the laws of relativity. We could probably answer 99.9% .9 of nations judging by social media wouldn't be able to follow already. So my second question is, clearly you are so interested in this topic and space has always been you and Flame Lab since the beginning. How do you think we can make space even more inclusive to the rest of nations? Okay. You are definitely the outlier. Um, we do have a space policy people thinking about it in mind. And uh, I just want to tap into your expertise. How do you think we should make nations more aware and interested in space? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. I can speak for a bit of personal experience. Um, earlier this year in January, I managed to go to Sabah for the very first time and I met some of the uh, amateur astronomer community over there. And they're in charge of this thing called the Dark Sky Project. And I believe that they are really tapping into something quite powerful. They're trying to protect the dark skies in Sabah and making sure that it's a natural preserve for astronomy. And I don't want to say, you know, we should all promote astrotourism in Sabah because, you know, too many people come in, then the light pollution becomes uh, even worse. But what I will say is that we can definitely learn from the passion of not just the professionals and the academics, people like me, but also from, I forgot what the name of the kaka was, <laughs> but she's there in Sabah and she's, she's quite happy to, to do her thing and look up uh, Dark Sky Malaysia and they are, uh, is it non-profit? But they're an organization that, that tries to protect the, the sky and that's one So go social, that's what you mean. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, all right. Thank you, Afik. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Right, thank you so much. Just to you are know, talking about neutron stars and whatnot. The only star that I know that holds dear to my heart is my little honey star. Okay? It doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that's about Afik with his presentation about astronomy going far, far, far away. Now let us bring this topic back a bit to Earth with our next presenter. Mr. Alvan C. Mengjing, also a student from Asia Pacific Union, and he'll be talking about.